And let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are a good and gracious God, even as we just sung, you are holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of your glory. And we thank you for the fact that, Lord, as imperfect, fallible beings, we can come before you and sing in spirit and in truth. And we come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. We thank you for the fact that we have the privilege of worshiping in this country together corporately like this, and that we have the freedom to sing songs unto the one true God. And Lord, I pray that this morning we would cherish and treasure that time. Father, our hearts are burdened this morning as we hear so many of the things that are going on in our society around us, those who have lost loved ones, Lord, in that local um, massacre, Lord, of college students. Father, we pray for your comfort and your encouragement upon those families, and that, Lord, you would use your people to bring hope through the sharing of the gospel of your son, Lord. I pray that you would do that. I pray that you would continue to comfort those who have lost their homes, Father, those who, those who have, uh, Lord, so much, lost so much of what they have worked their whole lives for. And I pray, Father, for opportunities for your church to bring your truth to bear in a loving and compassionate way. Lord, help us never to be indifferent or to ignore or to sweep under the rug the pains of others, even as we are learning from your son Jesus in the gospel of Mark, he is one who was compassionate towards people with physical um, disabilities and sicknesses and so many things, Lord. And his desire was to see all of that suffering end. And that is why he preached the gospel of the kingdom. I pray that we would be people of compassion, people of tender pity and tender mercy, really aching in our hearts for people. And Lord, using every opportunity in love to bring the hope of Jesus to bear upon every situation. Father, I pray for those who have lost loved ones this year. Lord, who are going to be celebrating, Lord, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's coming up, um, Lord, without those loved ones, um, those who have gone home to be with you, I just pray for your encouragement and comfort upon them, Lord. I pray that we as a church would come alongside of them and love on them and mourn with those who mourn and celebrate, Father, the lives of those that, they've, that have gone home to be with you, Lord, but to remember that, Lord, this is a hard time for them as well, so help us to come alongside of them in prayer and in very tangible, physical, visible ways, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll open your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 is our text for this morning. I'm very excited about this text, as I am every text out of Mark these days, but this one is a, just a powerful, powerful portion of Scripture as we continue to look at the life of our Lord. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And if you are able uh, physically to stand with me, please stand for the reading of the Word of God. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The Lord blessed the reading of his word. You may be seated. Well, how many of you went out this week? This is a very important week for multiple reasons, but how many of you went out this week to vote? Hence, good. That is awesome. Those of you who are actually able to vote, right? Some of us are too young still to do that. I remember the first time I got an opportunity to vote, I was so, so uh, um, uh, motivated and so joyful about the fact that I could finally throw in my lot, so to speak, right? 
Well, I don't know um, how, what, what, what have you been your reflections this week um, surrounding this whole issue of voting and all of that. Um, I tend to get pretty, um, pretty reflective um, uh, when times like these come around, uh, voting and all of that. Uh, people going into office and various propositions and all of that, and I start thinking deeply, obviously, about the things of the Lord. And, you know, there were many things that I, I was reflecting upon. For one thing, even in the light of the fact that we are celebrating uh, Veterans Day tomorrow, I was thinking about and just being reminded of the privilege that we have of being in this country. You know, it's a privilege to be here uh, as believers in the U.S. and to be able even to do things like vote. Amen? I mean, I was just thinking about the fact that if, you tra if you've traveled to some other countries, you can see some of the chaos in other countries. And of course, the Lord is sovereign over both situations. But we have the privilege, beloved, of being in a country where we're even able to worship this way and to vote. And uh, we should give thanks for that. I was full of gratitude this week as I thought about the fact that I have the opportunity as an American uh, living in this country to be able to do that. The other thing that I was reflecting upon is just how many problems we have as a country, huh? My goodness. My goodness. I mean, even just going to the voting place this week, so many tensions so many conversations that we um, overheard, people just whispering things, so many suspicious eyes, people looking at each other. And you know, above everything, what, what, what really stood out to me, how much fear and anxiety exists in the eyes of people regarding just everything going on in our country right now and even the whole vo uh, voting um, uh, thing that happened this week. Um, the next morning after the voting day, I was listening to the, watching the, the news, CNN and and um, uh, Fox News and some of the other news um, stations. And it's amazing. I'm sure some of you got a chance to witness this to just hear the discussions and the, just the malicious discussions that were taking place even on public national television. And people attacking each other and just trying to one up one another. And I kept thinking, how sad. How sad that even from a secular standpoint, do these people really think that they're going to accomplish anything that is good for our country by continuing to lash out at each other this way? And this just went on and on and on. People just being very unkind with their words and slanderous and gossipy and all of that. It was so sad to see that. And I don't know about you, but as I reflect on some of those things and the way that things are going in our society, I'm just very, very thankful. And I rejoice in the Lord that... I live in a country as a Christian where I can cast my vote, where I have the opportunity to speak, uh, on, speak into issues as a citizen of this country, things that are, are godless kinds of things, wicked kinds of things, and we can speak in a godly fashion or bring the truth to bear upon those things that are taking place in our world, and especially here in our country, that we have the opportunity to do that. I was just so grateful, but more grateful I was that chips may fall, beloved, where they may, but my confidence as a believer is not on the results of the vote, of the voting of this week. Amen? That is not what our confidence should be upon. Who's in office, um, what propositions went forward and which ones didn't. We absolutely care about those things. We should vote. We should speak into those things uh, as gospel transformed citizens. Take every opportunity that we can to speak into those things in a godly fashion. But ultimately, our confidence is not on whether those things go forward or not, right? Our confidence is upon Christ, a future kingdom that is, that is sure and steadfast and will not fade away, Right? That's what we're looking forward to. You see, it doesn't ultimately matter, ultimately, to Christians how things pan out in an ultimate way. Because as we know, things are headed in a very, in a very negative direction, right? So ultimately, we need to be careful that we know how things will end and we know who our king is so that we put our confidence upon our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to remind us that in a sense, the Gospel of Mark, John Mark, writing the Gospel of Mark under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the early to mid-A.D. 60s, was writing in a sense to encourage also his brethren in that, in that time because there was already the beginning of persecution and opposition under Nero in that time. 
And so one of the reasons why Mark writes his gospel is to encourage his brethren in the light of opposition, in the light of hostility, in the light of there were even the fact that they were, there were even disciples, key members of the early church who were already dying off some 30 plus years after Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended. And so the church, these people are watching these things happen, and they might be driven potentially to despair, to think, oh no, Christ is losing the battle. And so Mark writes this gospel, one of the reasons historically, to give a historical account of the one Jesus Christ who had come, who had lived, who died on the cross for their sins, who rose and who would be returning someday. And that should bring encouragement to these believers. That's why he writes to have their attention focused upon Jesus, to get the, these believers in the, in the first century to think about Christ, to, br- to bring him to bear upon their thinking in light of things that were happen- happening in the Roman Empire, and to bring the truth to bear upon other people who were drinking the Kool-Aid of, the, of, the, uh, of that culture, the Roman Empire. So it is today, beloved. We need to make sure that we put on our gospel glasses, right? As we see the society around us, we cannot despair. We cannot be putting our confidence or our trust on the results of these things. We need to put our confidence upon Jesus Christ. Just as John Mark was preaching Christ and the gospel of Mark to, those, to that audience, those believers, to encourage them so we can find encouragement in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? In the same way. You know, C.S. Lewis I disagreed with some issues, some beliefs of C.S. Lewis that he wrote about, but there were some other things that he was very helpful on. And you know, he wrote during post-World War II, and he wrote a lot about people needing to focus their attention on Christ in the light of the despair that came about because of the world wars. And he wrote this about Jesus Christ and our need to respond to him and not to ignore or be indifferent to Jesus Christ, quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Christ, that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to, end quote. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote that some 70 plus years ago, post-World War II, and it is, it is true today, beloved. The most important question for us as human beings, even in our country and in our world, watching everything that is taking place around us, is who do you believe Jesus to be? Who do you believe Jesus to be? And you must have an answer for that. And there are only two ways that you can go, the narrow way or the broad way. The broad way is the way that rejects Jesus' claims concerning who he is and what he did, and the narrow way is embracing him as Lord and Savior, confessing him as Savior of your life, right? There's only two ways. You know, for us today, we live in a very pluralistic society, don't we? Where there are many authorities, in fact, there are n- anybody's authority, as long as you really believe it with all of your heart, it's okay to believe it. Nobody can argue, right? Truth is relative. There's no absolute truth. Anybody can believe anything. There are multiple gods. And as long as your heart really feels that you need to believe in that God with a little g, as long as you do that and your heart feels this way, very passionate about it, it's okay even if you can't even verify who that God is, right? We live in that kind of a society. And yet... What we're learning from the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, even in our day and age today. Jesus alone, not any other authority, Jesus alone is is unrivaled in power, unrivaled in authority, and he is worthy to be worshipped and to be served and believed. Amen? No matter what is taking place in our society, this is what we are learning in, in Mark, that as we hear Jesus... We hear what he said. We watch what he did. We see how he interacted with people. 
We simply can't ignore or be indifferent to these things that we are hearing about our Lord Jesus Christ, beloved, because they are of eternal consequence to where you will spend eternity, in hell away from the presence of God or in heaven worshiping God and serving him forever and ever. We cannot ignore him. We cannot dismiss him. As C.S. Lewis wrote in that quote, and listen, all three gospel writers of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and even John as well, wrote their accounts for the express purpose that as we witness the words and the works of Christ, we might respond by believing in Jesus and confessing him as Lord. That is why they wrote. Listen to the words of the apostle John. In John chapter 20 and verse 30, he says this, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. And in fact, in the last verse of his gospel, he says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that not even the world itself, the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. For there were many other things that Jesus said, many other things that Jesus did. We simply get um, uh, snapshots of Jesus' words and works in the Gospels. You understand that, right? He did many other things and said some other marvelous things. But they pick out certain things uh, um, consistent with the purpose of that particular Gospel. But then listen to what he says in John 20, verse 31. But these signs or miracles have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's why he wrote his gospel. That's why all of the gospel writers wrote the things that they did under the inspiration of the Spirit. That we might respond by cherishing and treasuring and believing and trusting and serving Christ so that life is all about Christ, to live as Christ and to die as gain so that we might respond with that kind of an attitude, right? That's why Mark wrote his own gospel as well, so that believing we might have life in the name of Christ. And if you're going to believe in his name, then you must make sure that you believe in the Jesus of the Bible, right? As he's revealed in the Bible. And that's what we've been seeing in the Gospel of Mark. He is no wimpy, punk figure, helpless man, Jesus Christ. He is all-powerful, unrivaled in authority. He's able to do anything that we are not able to do, right? He's able to do anything. He has all authority. He came into hostile territory, and what have we seen already? That he has power over the spiritual realm, over things like demons, or beings like demons, over deadly physical Uh, sicknesses, over deadly diseases, even severe fevers, like Simon Peter's mother-in-law. There's nothing that Jesus can't do. You know why? Because he is God. As the Father is God and the Spirit is God, so Jesus is God. One God eternally existing as three persons, right? Jesus is God. Mark contains 19 miracles, beloved. 19 miracles, And of the 37, that's of the 37 miracles in the four Gospels. 19 of them are found in the Gospel of Mark. And Mark's portrait of Jesus, again, is Jesus as the suffering servant Savior who came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. All of his miracles validate his identity as God in human flesh. And so we must embrace him for who he is if we're going to accept the work that he did on our behalf, right? Going to the cross and dying for our sins. Now, as we get into chapter 2 here, we once again see the unrivaled authority of Jesus, this time as he heals a paralytic. And many times I've heard some sermons, even these last couple of weeks, guys really zero in on the physical healing. It's mind-boggling to me, but they do. On the healing of this paralytic that shows the, the power and the authority of Jesus over physical sickness But what I want us to do this morning, and I think it's the point of this passage, I want us to see that the Christ that we serve has complete authority over physical sickness, even as we've been seeing in the Gospel of Mark, but more importantly, over our spiritual sickness and spiritual decadence, right? Let me repeat that. I want us to see that Christ, the Christ that you and I serve, Yes, can heal any kind of disease. He has power and authority over any physical sickness. But more importantly, he has power and authority over our spiritual condition, our spiritual predicament, beloved. 
That we were, who were spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins were raised from within so that we might see the glory of Christ, right? Jesus is able to do that in the life of people. Now, as we look at this miracle in verses 1 through 12, I want us to see this in, in sort of five snapshots of this pa- in this passage here. Five snapshots. You know, you've heard the term, the, um, the statement, a picture is worth a thousand words, Right? You know, that's very true. A picture is worth a thousand words. And, and in Mark, that's kind of, you need to keep thinking that way because Mark is moving quickly to the cross. He is saying, and immediately, here we go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. He doesn't get into, into details in these accounts. And we don't always hear, see the, hear or see the responses from people in these accounts. They are snapshots, quick glimpses or pictures of things that are taking place in these various um, events. So I want us to see these five snapshots here. First of all, we see the setting of the miracle here. The setting of the miracle in verses one and two. We've already seen that wherever Jesus is, there are people around him, right? He attracts a crowd. And here again, in verses one through two, we see him coming back from this tour around Galilee with his disciples. They've been preaching and teaching and healing diseases and all of that. And Jesus is now back in his, what became really his headquarters the home of Simon Peter in Capernaum. That's where Jesus continues to come back throughout his ministry until he heads to Jerusalem to the cross. And so here he is, and soon word gets around that Jesus is back. Jesus is back in this home, and before you know it, there's this large audience of very very fascinated, very intrigued people, and most of them are, are just simply just enamored in a superficial way by his miracles, but they don't understand who he is. Remember that. As we continue to see certain people respond to Jesus in a certain way with amazement and astonishment, don't always assume that that means that they had saving faith, that they truly believed in who Jesus is and thus what he was about to do for them as to die on the cross for their sins. They're fascinated. They're enamored, these crowds, but mostly because of his miracles, because of his great power. And so here you have a a jammed, packed-out house with no room to move, and as always, as was his custom, look at the end of verse two, it says that Jesus was speaking the word to them. He was speaking the word to them, and this is not the same same, um, uh, terminology here for preaching or public proclamation. He's informally teaching the word, and we know what his focus was from back in chapter one, verses 14 and 15. He's preaching the word, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news concerning himself, and the kingdom that was here now. Now watch this. Here is a large audience. Many people are here in this home, many different types of people with different kinds of attitudes towards Christ. Some of them are recipients of his miracles, perhaps, or maybe have friends or family who have been recipients of his miracles. They've heard of what Jesus has done. Some of them are eyewitnesses of great signs that have taken place. Others are there eager to see another great sign Some of them have heard his great teachings. Some of them have just heard by word of mouth what Jesus has done, and they're just there ready, captive to watch some other big thing happen, right? There are all kinds of people who are there. But beloved, listen, not many of those who are there, if any at that moment, except his his, uh, disciples, right, and maybe a few others, have saving faith. They have, not many of them have believed in him, have committed to follow after him as his four disciples have. Not many of them have. And listen, not many of these people would into the future. They would reject him. Some of these people would be those who would oppose him vehemently. And some of these people were people who perhaps even later on, some two years later, would make even the trip all the way to Jerusalem to yell, crucify him. Right? Many of these people would oppose him. But what I want you to think for a minute here is this. Here is the, here is Jesus in the midst of teaching of the gospel of the kingdom and no doubt even calling people to, to repent and believe. That's what he, it says back in chapter one and verse 15, that Jesus was saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He was always calling, summoning them calling them to put their trust in the good news that he was preaching, right, concerning himself. He's doing this. He's preaching. He's summoning people to repent and believe in him. And all of a sudden, as perhaps there is conversation surrounding the nature of faith 
and what faith is, here comes the perfect live illustration of what faith does. Amazing. This is not an allegory here. This is not a metaphor that's taking place here. He literally will, will heal a paralytic physically to show his great power and authority, thus showing who he is. But it is also amazing that in the providence of God, here comes a perfect way of illustrating what faith does, beloved. So secondly, we see the occasion of the miracle, the occasion of the miracle, which was this surface need of a paralyzed man. Jesus is in the midst of teaching, and verse 3 says, And they came, bringing a paralytic, carried by four men. That verb there, and they came, is what we call a historical present tense. And it basically pictures something that happened in the past, but it's written as if it's happening before your very eyes, in real time. You know, maybe you've seen those movies where an actor is in, is in deep thought and, and it begins to reminisce about something in the past, right? But as he's thinking and we're, we're, um, we, we see that scene, it almost feels to him and, and to those of us who are watching this scene as if it's happening in very real time, right? That's the idea here. Behold, says Mark, this is happening all of a sudden, immediately, before your very eyes, this is taking place. Now notice in verses 3 and 4 that Mark emphasizes what? The actions of these friends, their activity, their conduct. Verse 3, they came. Verse 4, they removed. Verse 4, they dug. Verse 4, they let down. Mark is highlighting in these things the determined actions of these four friends here. How determined were they? Verse 4, they are unable to get to Jesus, right? You can imagine a packed out house. No room to even walk anywhere. And by the way, these are very insensitive crowds, right? Because what do you do when there's a special needs person around you in a public place or wherever you might be in your home? What do you typically do? You give that person the seat, right? You let them through so that they might be served. You defer to that person who has those special needs. Well, they can't even get through these crowds. They don't, they're not even allowing this paralytic man to see Jesus. No big deal for these four, right? What do they do? They proceed to go outside the house, up the external stairway, which would have been typical in those days with houses, an external stairway leading to the flat roof of the house where sometimes they would sleep or they would do other activities on the roof of the house. And what do they do? They begin digging a hole through the roof down to where Jesus is. Man, what's the matter with these guys, right? What's up with them? I mean, don't they know how to take no for an answer? I mean, hey, maybe it's probably not God's will for them to do this if they weren't able to get through to Jesus, right? Why are they going through some unconventional, uh, uh, using unconventional means to get to Jesus? No, they're very determined, right? Was it dangerous? Somewhat. Would it have damaged the roof of that house? To some extent it would have, but not as much as maybe one of our roofs today. The houses were made very differently then as they are now. Most roofs at the time were made of large beams, roughly three to four feet apart. And then across those beams, they would lay down sticks or wood slabs that would be removed or replaced more easily than today. And then over those, they would lay down thatch, which was a covering of material like straw or reeds or plant material very tightly woven together. And they would lay that down as well. And then all of it would be sort of glued together, put together with mud and some kind of covering that was like anti-rain. And so it didn't take a jackhammer, beloved, for the men to dig through the roof, and it could be easily, more easily repaired as well. Having said that, it was very unconventional, wasn't it? And, it? and it cost them some time to do that. And it showed, beloved, their determination. These men were not going to give up. They were going to figure out exactly where Jesus was located inside the house, and they were going to dig through the roof and get this man through the roof because they believed that Jesus could do something with him, right? They were determined. They were persistent. And so can you imagine Jesus is teaching there, and all of a sudden, debris and mud start slowly falling, right? On top of people, maybe over Jesus, slowly but surely, and then eventually you begin to see this dim sun ray going through, brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger, and then a growing hole in the roof, and eventually you see this man, this paralyzed man being lowered on a pallet right down to Jesus, right down to him. 
How long did this all take? We don't know. The text doesn't tell us how long it took, right? Were people yelling and screaming, bloody murder? We, who knows, right? Who knows? But what determination? What faith? They didn't think to themselves, what will people think? What will it look like? Won't we look stupid doing something like this? Won't people reject us? Or what if Jesus can't do anything about this? What if the word out on the street really isn't true concerning him? What if this is beyond him here to heal a paralyzed man? They didn't think about those things. And please remember that everyone's attention is on these four men, especially on this paralyzed man. Perhaps the crowd is in shock or outrage, maybe even annoyed at the fact that how dare these guys do such a thing to bypass us to get to Jesus, the main attraction? Well, what a great opportunity this occasion of a paralyzed man presents for our Lord, right? What a great real-life illustration that as Jesus is teaching about the gospel of the kingdom and calling these people to faith, here come these guys very visibly, physically showing what faith does in action, right? The stage is set now for the healing, the physical healing of this man. Well, so we would think. But there's a strange turn of events here in verse 5, right? So we see, thirdly, the significance of the miracle. The significance of the miracle in verse 5. As we've seen already in Mark, you would think that Jesus wouldn't just uh, proceed to do this, would just proceed to do this physical healing just like he has in the Gospel of Mark up until this point. He would heal this man, show his great power, but for the first time, at least explicitly, we see in Mark that while Jesus was full of compassion and healed physical illnesses, there was something more important that he had come to do, right? At least we see it in his miracle here. We already know that his purpose was to preach the gospel. We already know that it was to preach the gospel of God's kingdom, that that was his purpose. That's why that was his priority. But now we see it even in a miracle. Look at verse 5. And Jesus, notice, seen their faith. What is that all about? I thought he just saw physical actions, determination, persistence. Exactly, right? He saw in those actions faith at work in these individuals who were there who trusted in his ability to do what he was about to do. This is what faith does, beloved. Faith works, right? Works are not the basis of our justification. It's the person and the work of Jesus Christ alone, right? But if you are transformed and you, God has given you the, the gift of saving faith and it will show forth in the fruit of your life, in your conduct, in your behavior, in your priorities and pursuits, right? This is a good picture of that. Our conviction of who Christ is drives our behavior. And we see this in an, as, a, as a wonderful little illustration here, a real life illustration in the lives of these individuals. But notice that Jesus directs himself only to the paralytic in verse five. It says, seeing their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Son is the word child, a, a parental type of affectionate title that he gives, or how he refers to him here. Son or child, your sins are forgiven. Now notice this. How do we get to this point? How do we go from physical paralysis and these individuals doing this physically to all of a sudden Jesus talking about your sins are forgiven? Just out of the blue, Jesus says this. I mean, if I were that guy, I would have been like, thank you very much, but hello, you know? Lord, why was I brought here for the physical healing part? Now, that's not what this man does, right? In fact, we don't even have the response of this individual or of his four friends to Jesus' statement, but we know this, beloved. We know of the fact that Jesus, who knows the hearts of people, as we're going to see in verses 8 through 11 in a little bit, could see through this man's heart and see his faith. This man was needy from the heart, for far more than physical healing, the real need this man had was to be forgiven of his sins. Was to be forgiven of his sins. And you know what? Forgiveness of our sins is 
the need of every single human born into this world, right? Every single one of us needs forgiveness of sins. Every single one of us, unless we are forgiven of our sins, based upon the atoning work of Jesus Christ, and made right with God, do you understand that you will perish in hell? And the least of your worries is what happens on this earth. It's the least of your worries. You will have to stand before the great judge, your creator, who created you for his glory to live for him, and you lived a life rejecting him and rejecting the only provision for the forgiveness of your sins, the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. Our greatest need is to be forgiven of our sins. Listen, your greatest need this morning is not perfect good health. It's not physical, no more physical suffering. It's not I need more money and I would be happy. I need more material possessions. I need greater education, more career success. We need more social reform in our society or we're gonna perish, absolutely not. Our greatest need is not better political leaders. Our greatest need is not that all the propositions that we voted for go through favorably for us. That is not our greatest need, beloved. It is not to have more military power so that America trumps over everybody in the universe. For some of you who are younger, who are young people, youth, listen to me. Your greatest need is not more friends, not more people to like you. Your greatest need is not more gadgets. Your greatest need is not more social media. Your greatest need is not more self-esteem, more popularity. Your greatest need is not some girl or boyfriend. That is not your greatest need. Your greatest need is that you will be forgiven of your sins. That is your greatest need, to be made right with a holy God, a holy God that you have offended that you have sinned against, that you have not loved every single waking moment, day, minute of your life perfectly so as to obey him perfectly. You have sinned against him. He who created you for his glory, you've turned your back on your creator. You've lived not even conscious of him, not acknowledging that he exists, not giving him thanks every single day, every second of the day for keeping you alive on this earth. You have sinned against him. Consequently, you are a guilty sinner who stands condemned before a holy, holy God. And there's no way for you to save yourself, is there? No way for you to save yourself. Who do they come to? Christ. Who granted this man forgiveness of sins? Christ did. He is the one that you must come to if you are to be forgiven. You know what the good news is? That you might be in a desperate predicament that I just described right now, guilty and condemned, but here is the good news. Ready? It's not about anything that you've done or it's not about anything that you can do to save yourself. It's about what Jesus has done. The good news is the person of Jesus, the God-man who came to earth, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He is the great sin bearer who took upon your sins upon himself, died in your place, absorbed the wrath of God for your personal sins upon himself, but rose again, conquering sin and death victoriously on the third day. Amen? That is the good news. And that is great news for people like us who are destitute spiritually speaking, right? who have con committed horrible injustices, who have committed horrible sins against people, who every day think evil thoughts and hateful thoughts about other people, even if you would not articulate them. We are murderers in our hearts. We're all sinners guilty before a holy God. And yet Jesus says, I offer you my righteousness, my perfect life, and my atoning death, and you give me your sin and I'll deal with it and nail it to the cross, right? Right? That's what he does. That's what he does. This is good news for the sinner, isn't it? And who can be forgiven? Who can be forgiven? Those who do good enough things? Those who earn God's favor? 
Those who are really moral, upstanding citizens in society and even give all, kind, all kinds of money to humanitarian efforts all over the world and orphanages and everything, those people will be justified in the sight of God? Absolutely not. Our righteousness and our good works are like filthy rags before God, right? There's only one who has pleased the Father perfectly, and that is his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, right? And in his perfect life, so those whose good deeds outweigh their bad deeds or think that they're good people will find no justification before God, no salvation. See, God doesn't grade on a curve, right? At all. He doesn't grade you in comparison to how much less of a sinner you are to another sinner here on this earth. That's not how he grants forgiveness. The forgiven person, my friend this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, the forgiven person by God is the one who looks at his or her spiritual bank account and says, I have nothing, nothing, nothing in my account. I am bankrupt, spiritually speaking. I am in so much debt that there is no way that I can ever even begin to pay back uh, my creator for all the things that I've done to break his holy law. We simply can't pay that debt. And so that kind of person who sees their spiritual bankruptcy and says, I need Jesus. I am spiritually paralyzed. There's nothing that I can do to save myself. I'm spiritually dead in my trespasses and sins. Oh, Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe that you are the God man who came and took upon my sins upon yourself and died on the cross for my sins. And you paid for my sins on the cross. That person is forgiven. Who comes humbly before God and confesses his or her sins as an unworthy sinner. Jesus said at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? Blessed or happy are the poor in spirit. You know what that means? Those who are spiritually bankrupt. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, he said. This is why Paul said, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of Christ. Why? Because the cross of Christ was the basis of his forgiveness, right? He did nothing. He did nothing. Even faith is a gift that Paul, exp that Paul showed. A gift of God to him. So listen, this poor, destitute, helpless man came to Jesus by faith, knowing that only Jesus, not only could Jesus heal him physically, but he could heal him spiritually, right? Jesus saw faith in this man, and he forgave him of his sins. Now notice, there are always those who in stark contrast are the opposite, right? So we have in verses six and seven, the doubters of the miracle, the doubters or skeptics of the miracle. Look at verse six. But some of the Pharisees were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Please underline that, in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? As always, there are always those who doubt Jesus, right? Who are skeptics. And here we have these religious leaders who are here. Mark doesn't record, as I said, the response of the four men, nor of the paralytic to his statement about that him being forgiven. But he abruptly turns to the suspicious thoughts of these skeptical religious leaders. Luke 5, 17, the parallel account tells us that there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law in the audience. And Mark here calls them scribes. These are the experts of the law. These are the, the superficial theologians who don't live out even what they preach, who viewed themselves as the, as the protectors and gatekeepers of the law, but even more of the added tradition of the rabbis over the, the, the decades. Some of these scribes have made the trip all the way from Jerusalem, others from the regions around Galilee and Judea, having heard of Jesus' popularity, and they see him as a threat. And you know what? They want to catch him in something. It's not that they're there because they really believe in Jesus, because they really want to believe in Christ. No. They are there because they want to oppose him. They want to catch him in something. They are hostile toward him. And upon hearing Jesus granting forgiveness of sins, right, what do they think in their hearts? They're indignant Verse six, reasoning in their hearts. And this wasn't something that they were saying out loud, right? Verse seven, why does this man speak that way? They're thinking this. He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
Now listen, before we get, become really hard on these guys, were they right? Yes, they were right. They're thinking correctly. Their, their theology is correct. No one has the right to grant forgiveness of sins except who? God. God. And any man who claims the authority to forgive sins is a, is a blasphemer worthy of death, according to Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16, which gives evidence to the blasphemer being put to death, right? They're right. Their inward reasonings are true. They're asking the right questions, except for one thing, one small detail that's critical, and it's they don't understand who Jesus is or believe him, right? Fourthly, Notice the authority of the miracle, the authority of the miracle. We've seen the setting, the occasion, the significance, the doubters, fifth, rather, the authority of the miracle in verses eight through 11. These scribes have a very real concern, and you know what it surrounds? The issue of authority. And in their thinking, their correct thinking, no man, especially Jesus, has the authority to pronounce forgiveness. Why? Because sin, by definition, is first and foremost, ultimately against God, right? against God. And so Jesus, by telling this man that his sins are forgiven, he's essentially saying, not only do I forgive you of the sins committed against me, but as God, I forgive you. I release you of the debt that you owe me. And the religious leaders are thinking, who does he think he is? Who does he think he is? Thinks he's God? And so what does the Lord do? He establishes his deity. This is what Jesus does. Look at verse 8. Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit, not the Holy Spirit, but speaking of what he's, he's thinking in his own heart within, immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? He's essentially saying, I know what you're thinking, right? And it's stinking thinking, right? Anybody ever do that to you? You're having a discussion with somebody that's close to you or whatever, and they know you very well, and they're, you know, they're, they're pleading their case before you, and you're just completely quiet, and at some point they say, they say, I know what you're thinking right now. You say, I don't, I don't even know what I, I didn't even say anything. I know, but you were thinking it, right? <laughs> you know, humans do that to one another. Even humans that maybe are very close to you, but we can't do that perfectly. We're not omniscient. We don't have perfect knowledge and instantaneously able to read one another's hearts. Only God can do that, right? Only God can do that. And this is what Jesus does here. He pinpoints exactly what they are thinking. Now, we're Bible-reading Christians, Bible-believing Christians, and we know that there's only one who is able to do that, who's omniscient, who knows all things perfectly, instantaneously, at all times, and it is God, right? Right? Listen to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. And Jeremiah asks, who can understand it? Who can figure out the heart? Who knows what, are, what, what is in the inner recesses of a person's thoughts and intentions and motives? And then God speaks, I, the Lord, or Yahweh, search the heart. I test the mind. The Lord is able to do that. Psalm 139, verse 4, even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Before I say anything, God already knows what I'm about to say. God already knows what you're about to say. And Jesus does the same thing here. In fact, in John chapter 2, verses 24 to 25, it says that Jesus was not entrusting himself to men, for he himself knew the hearts of men. He knew what was inside of men. He was om he's omniscient. The fact that he exposed their heart was evidence of his deity, already validation of his authority, which is what they are questioning, right? What authority? Who gives you the authority to forgive sins and to do these kinds of things? Jesus says, hey, listen, I can even read your own thoughts. And then look at verses 9 through 11. He answers their challenge to his authority with a question and then a demonstration of that unrivaled authority. He asked them in verse 9, which is easier, to say... To the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. And please note what he's saying to them. He's asking them, which is easier to say, to simply profess or to announce or declare, right? Which is easier to simply say? 
If we were asked that question, we would answer, well, of course, it's easier to simply say your sins are forgiven. You know why? Because you cannot prove it one way or the other immediately, right? How do you measure that? How do you verify that particular statement to somebody or declaration or pronouncement to somebody? You can't prove it immediately right away that they are forgiven. How do you do that? The harder thing to say is get up, pick up your pallet, and walk, right? Why is that? Because the physical healing, beloved, is immediately verifiable, right? You will be immediately able to see if it will happen right away. Now watch what Jesus does here. He chooses the harder of the two, doesn't he? At least from the human perspective. The impossible thing is for any human to forgive. Only God can do that. But verse 10, he says, but so that you might know that the Son of Man, and the Son of Man there 14 times it appears in the Gospel of Mark. It speaks to Jesus' humanity and humility, at least in the Gospel of Mark. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, verse 11, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And verse 12 tells us that this man got up and immediately did that, right? He was healed. What is Jesus doing here? He is answering the challenge to his authority to forgive sins by saying, let me show you that I have authority to forgive sins by doing the harder thing from a human perspective and demonstrate to you that just as I am able to heal physically a paralytic, so I have the power and authority as God to forgive sins, right? His miracle of healing the paralytic validated his deity and his authority as God to forgive sins. And note, he just says, he speaks to the paralytic to be healed, and his words are like action, right? They, are, they, be, they bear results. Somebody has said this, quote, when it comes to God, his words are deeds. Just as he said, let there be light, and there was light, there was no work, he simply declared, let there be light, and there is light. When God says something, it just happens. God's word is his way of getting things done, end quote. It's the kind of authority that Jesus had. Just get it done. So he establishes his authority and that he shows them that he is God. Now lastly, I want you to see this. This is all happening before the masses, a lot of people who are in this home, right? People are watching this and what is their response? What is the response of these people? And that is an ongoing theme in the Gospel of Mark. How do people respond to the words and the works of Christ, right? And you might ask yourself the same question even now. When you hear and read these accounts and you hear messages concerning who Jesus is and the types of things that he does, what is your response? And that is our fifth snapshot here, the response to the miracle in verse 12, the response to the miracle. Everyone just witnessed not only healing this man's surface need, but more importantly, his real need to be forgiven. How did they respond? Verse 12, notice. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. They recognize his power. They see his authority. They witnessed that. And at first glance, when we read a verse like that or read other verses and passages in the Gospel of Mark concerning the responses like that, it seems like it's a great response. All, everybody in that house must have come to know the Lord. Everybody must have trusted in Jesus in a saving way so that Jesus probably marked it and recorded this, but they were all told that they were to be forgiven of their sins, right? Wrong. Wrong. Luke 5 says that they were filled with fear even, saying we have seen remarkable things today. So there's amazement and praise and people glorifying God, giving God the credit to what's taking place. Even fear they're displaying. It's all good, right? Beloved, listen, they were not repenting of their sins, nor did they have genuine saving faith in Jesus, most of these people. In fact, Matthew chapter 9 in verse 8, the parallel account to this, comments that the crowds, listen, glorified God, ready? Who had given such authority to men. Men. He was just a man to them. 
Jesus had just shown them his power, his authority, not only to heal but to forgive. Only God could do this, right? And yet they just see him as a man instead of recognizing their need for forgiveness of their sins as well. Many of these people will walk away from him, not ever trusting in him, right? There are masses and crowds of people constantly after Jesus, and many will reject him. Listen, beloved, something that we learn in reading in the, the Gospels and the response to Jesus is this. Ready? It's quite possible to be astonished, amazed, even praise God, and even be fearful of the things that we hear, and yet not repent of your sins so that you trust Jesus and, and commit to following him for the rest of your life. It's very possible to do that. And this is ultimately a work of the Spirit, to turn from your sins and put your faith in the Lord. But you know what? God holds you directly responsible for how you respond to the things that you hear, right? The theme of unbelief is prominent in the Gospels and in Mark. All kinds of people see Jesus heal paralytics, lepers, hundreds of diseases, deadly fevers, cast out demons all over the place, even demons who, who are scared of Jesus and obey him, who declare, you are the Holy One of God, the Son of God. They even declare, they witness concerning who Jesus is. All of these crowds, people hear these kinds of things, but what is their response? He's just a man. He's just a prophet. Elijah, after the order of Elijah, John the Baptist resurrected. That's what he is. And even here in Mark, we have a great audience, maybe even a few who believe, right? But most of them are self-righteous, religious leaders who are hostile to Jesus. Jesus had many people exposed to him, beloved, but not many who would follow him, not many who would commit their lives to him. Let me ask you this morning, which character are you? I mean it, seriously. Which character are you? Would you fall under the, one of the intrigued, fascinated amongst the crowds? Enamored by Jesus in a superficial way? You always want to be around the things of the Lord, around people gathering who worship Christ, around social activities of the church, but you know deep down in the recesses of your heart that you do not love Christ. You do not live for him. You have not turned from your sins truly and trusted in him. You don't live that way. It doesn't show forth in your life. You're just intrigued, right? You're looking for the next sign through God's people, perhaps. You're intrigued by a people who love one another, right? Oh, well, this is such a beautiful place to be all the time. Listen, you know what? May you have that kind of an attitude. This is a beautiful place to be, but because you understand that we're here because of the fact that we are sinners saved by grace and we act that way and live that way because we love Christ and we've given our lives to him, right? May that be you. So who are you? Are you the religious leader? legalistic, trusting in your own morality, you're self-righteous, you're skeptical all the time about anything regarding Christ, trying to find some inconsistency with Jesus, even having been given enough evidence over the many years of the truth of the gospel and who he is in his person and his work, you still want more evidence because you keep saying, if I have more evidence and I won't reject him anymore, I'll give my life to him. Listen, you are a liar. You're a liar. It doesn't matter how much evidence you get. Your problem is not the lack of evidence. Your problem is unbelief. You reject the only provision of God for the salvation of your soul and the forgiveness of your sins. And you need to repent of that. You need to turn from your sins and trust in Christ. Perhaps you're the paralytic this morning. And maybe you see your spiritual decadence. You see that you have no hope and that you need healing from the inside out. Maybe you're, you're here this morning and that's who you are. And I would encourage you and exhort you, today is the day of salvation, right? The day it is. And in the quietness of your heart or with somebody who can help you, you need to come clean before the Lord. Who do you believe Jesus to be? Is he God in human flesh? Or is he just another man, 
another prophet, another wise person, another wonder worker. Listen, Jesus doesn't need any of us, right? He doesn't go, oh, please open your heart to me, Kempis. I'm so lonely, says Jesus. Jesus never has done that and doesn't need any of us. He has come because he is a gracious savior, right? And his summons and his call to each and every one of us is not to embrace him as a great moral teacher, but as the very son of God who came to earth to pay for sins on the cross and rise again victoriously on the third day, right? And he is soon to return so that no matter what is taking place in our society around us, beloved, we can have a a hope that is sure and steadfast and will not pass away reserved in heaven for us who are in Christ, right? The Gospel of Mark, as we continue to behold Christ, we need to respond to him with obedient faith. Have you repented of your sins this morning? Have you trusted in Jesus' death on the cross for your personal sins? Listen, I leave you with this. One day, the same Jesus whom Mark portrays as a humble, suffering, servant, savior who was compassionate during his incarnation on earth, who served people, caring for their deepest spiritual needs, more importantly, he will come in a different way. He will come in a different way. And the question is this, will you stand before Jesus someday as a forgiven sinner, a friend of Christ, somebody who is a co-heir of a, of a future kingdom with him? Or will you stand before him as his enemy, as one whom he will judge and pour his wrath upon you for rejecting his free offer of salvation, of forgiveness of sins? Which one will you be? Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your grace in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross of your son. Father, these real historical accounts, we know that first and foremost point to the great reality of who your son is, that he is God, that he is fully man and fully God. And they also point us as we understand who he is to the great reality that he is our only hope, that he paid for our sins on the cross, and that he rose from the dead conquering sin and death victoriously. Lord, we want to be people who are found in him someday in the future when your son returns. Help us to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture quotations taken from the New American Standard Bible. Copyright by the Lockman Foundation.